So I believe that learning should be entertaining, and I believe that it should be aligned with the way that people think, work, and play. Uh, when I was working in visual effects, we uh, would spend the, the, the winters uh, creating television shows, or, or visual effects for television shows, and we'd spend the summers uh, making small games for Disney and Warner Brothers that would be used for special features or perhaps um, uh, for marketing. But in the summer of 2004, uh, Warner Brothers came to us and said, would, we'd like you to collaborate on a game for, uh, collaborate with us on a game for the US Army. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of a serious game or a game for learning. And it was the first time, uh, it was one of the first games ever produced for the US Army. In the game, soldiers would walk around in a, in a first-person uh, environment and try to identify IEDs in Fallujah. Now, the Army brass said, these are soldiers, they're not going to, about all serious games, they said, these are soldiers, they're not going to play, they're not, they're not going to want to play games. But what they found was that not only did the soldiers play video games, or play, play the serious game once, they would go back and play it again to try and increase their score and beat their buddies. Can you imagine taking a lecture for a second time to increase your, increase your knowledge or increase your score? Um, so the Army was on to something. And I happily uh, walked back to visual effects and didn't look back to uh, technology-enabled training for another five years. But when we did come back, an entire industry had spawned around serious gaming and around, uh, around games for learning. And we were tasked to... Um, to build a, a learning game for the Royal Canadian Air Force, or at least to collaborate on a game with the Royal Canadian Air Force. And uh, the game was to teach aircraft maintainers how to do their job. So the, one of the scenarios that, that we were presented with was a, um, in, in the scenario, a sergeant, sort of in a monotone voice, said, go into the hangar and fix this broken F-18. And, uh, you know, that was okay, but my sort of film side uh, kicked in and said, well, wh what's my motivation? Why, why, am I, why am I doing this? And so we suggested that we show an F-18, you know, taking fire and being damaged and, and, and flying back to base and, and, you know, the way we would have done it in visual effects, but uh, this obviously for this sort of thing was cost prohibitive. Uh, so we settled on the idea of a trained voice actor um, with, a, with a radio filter on um, that in sort of stressed out, said, I'm taking fire, I'm heading back to base. And then another voice actor that, that became the sergeant, so it wasn't, a, what, wasn't so monotone, saying, um, now you get in there and get that plane back online. It, it wasn't a big change in scope, it wasn't a big change in, in, in dollar figures, but it was a big change in engagement. And it gave you a reason for being, it gave you an emotional connection with the story, and it caused you to have some sort of uh, motivation and some sort of uh, urgency for taking the game, which actually was for taking your training. So I want to make something clear that when I'm saying that I want to make learning entertaining, I'm not trying to change the way that people learn. Uh, I don't think that the way that people learn has changed in 200,000 years. I think we learn by doing and by seeing and, and through story. And we've passed on information that way for generations. I think that the way that we teach people has changed drastically in the last thousand years and settled down to where it is today um, around the time of industrialization. So what I'm trying to do is, is align the way that we teach people with, to be in line with the way that we learn. And I'm trying, to, um, I'm trying to make learning entertaining for 12 year old Scott who is always bored in school. And, uh, who, you know, was sort of a, 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 a generally a, a C student and, and wasn't really engaged. Back then, we didn't have technology to make things better. Um, video games were plugged into your TV through a coaxial cable. Uh, my future career in visual effects uh, didn't exist. And I spent my time doing way more entertaining things like, like sailing or, or, or painting or watching cartoons. But I can remember a bunch of, or I can remember teachers that, that stood out as, as, as favorite teachers during that time. And when I did get back involved with technology-enabled learning, I started to think, well, what was it that made them different? Why did they stand out? And I think the thing is that using the tools that they had at the time, they, they found a way to engage their audience, the class, and make the lesson entertaining. I had a, I had a, a history teacher in high school um, that made history come to life. 
so much so that I got an A, which I, I normally wouldn't have gotten, and uh, went on to take history in college, where I promptly dropped out. Uh, <laughs> hi history hadn't changed at all. Uh, my, enga <laughs> my, my engagement level did. Um, I still love history, and I, I still watch, uh, I still watch you know, history documentaries whenever I can get my hands on them, and I only wish the college could be that entertaining. So if we're going to align learning with the way that people think, work, and play, we have to really de determine who it is we're trying to train and, and, and what it is that they like to do and what it is that they, that, they do, that they spend their time doing. And we probably have to look at millennials because millennials are now the largest group in the workforce and, and are the majority of trainees. So uh, Jane McGonigal, in her, in her TED talk about gaming uh, can change the world, said that these millennials, the largest group in the workforce, um, they spend about 10,000 hours playing video games by the time they're 21. That's the amount of time that uh, Malcolm Gladwell believes it takes to become an expert in a field. She also said that one group of gamers, uh, one particular group of gamers, will spend about, or have already accumulated about six million years of gameplay uh, in this one game, which is the amount of time that humans have been evolving as a species. I'll add to the gaming side of it and say that North Americans uh, over the age of three, will we'll watch about 35 hours of television per week. And millennials will watch that television or videos on their mobile phone. 35 hours is an entire extra week of work that could be harnessed. On that mobile device, those millennials will also be engaging in 1.7 hours of social media per day. Why are they doing this? Because that's what entertains them. Because that's how you engage them. So I want to make learning entertaining as well. So if you imagine, let's say, a welder. She is, she is a visual hands-on learner, and she learns her trade through practicing her art from another artist. She learns her trade doing hands-on visual things, learns her art, actually, from another artist. We can't change that with te technology. What we can do is we can take technology and align her theory her book training, her brick and mortar training with her art, visual, hands-on, and engaging. We can take Wemyss and we can put it into a video game. We can take meteorology and we can, we can turn it into a, a, an entertaining uh, a video. We can connect her through social media with, with, uh, with other artists, other, other welders, all over the world, and she can collaborate with them. Imagine a naval officer. He, he steps onto the bridge of a ship and the ship costs a billion dollars, and, and it costs a million dollars a day to operate, he shouldn't be there learning how to turn the dials on a, on a radio or, or learning terminology. He should be stepping onto the bridge to practice his art and, and wasting no time. We can take the radio and emulate it in the computer. We can, take, you know, we can, we can actually have him have worked through all of his jobs on the bridge before he arrives, so that when he steps onto the bridge, he's practicing his art. Imagine a drilling instructor. He's the best drilling instructor on the planet, or, or at least the best one in Canada, let's say. And he is trying to train the future of drillers. And he's trying to talk to them about what goes on within pipes a mile, two miles under the ground. And he's doing it with a whiteboard. We can take that whiteboard, and, 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 and instead of having him struggle with, the, with, with drawing on the whiteboard, we can give him a, a, an interactive touchscreen emulation that emulates all the dials that the driller sees, emulates the, the um, printout, that he sees as the, as the supervisor and runs through scenarios with them with, with engaging videos to explain complex operations under the ground, we can let him practice the art of teaching and not be encumbered by the, the, um, uh, by the, the use of the whiteboard. Imagine a 12-year-old that's, that's struggling to get through history in school, yet he knows the name and the, the statistics for every Skylander, and he knows the subtle differences between a, a Sith and a Jedi. Imagine if you were to take his history curriculum and turn it into an entertaining game that, that he could use at school. So why isn't all, all learning like this? Because you have to identify who the user and the buyer is. And the buyer probably doesn't have to suffer through the training or suffer through the learning. And so they're going to, every time, pick the, the least, least expensive way to qualify for the minimal mandatory requirements uh, in every case. So why stand here and talk about entertaining learning when people aren't buying it or people, people, people don't get it yet? Because it's the right thing to do. 
because we're in a knowledge-based economy, because the amount of time we have to transfer knowledge is getting smaller and smaller. Um, my job didn't exist when I was in high school. We're teaching kids that, that, that their jobs don't exist yet, the, the, the jobs that we're training them for don't exist yet. Because as one aerospace executive told me, he is anticipating the retirement of 50% of his workforce in the next 10 years. These are baby boomers with 35 years of experience, intellectual capital, and the key to their company is going to have to pass that information on to the millennials with seven years experience. People that entertain themselves, watching, playing video games, watching videos, and engaging in social media, probably on a smartphone or probably online, and probably in two-minute chunks. And this scares them. Um, we, we, we've dealt with people that, that say, well, you know, that's fine for millennials, but my 40-year-old workers, rig workers, aren't going to, or aren't, aren't going to play a video game, and are, they're not going to enjoy being entertained. And uh, so we said, okay, well, here's some e-learning, and we'll put it right beside some entertaining videos and some games. And the 40-year-old workers chose the entertaining games every single time. And not only did they choose the game, but they went back and played it a second time to try and beat their buddies, the score of their buddies. So it, it may be a bit of an uphill battle, but if you look for organizations that believe in culture, and you look for organizations that believe in, in um, their people, the culture starts with the first time you train someone, you engage them with your brand. It, it starts with your learning. And so you want your learning to be entertaining and to pass on your culture. You look for organizations that, uh, that want to be the best train on earth, whether it be an airline for safety or a military because they need to be better than their competition. Look for uh, organizations that, that believe in continual learning because if learning is entertaining, people will take it not only at work, but they'll take it to learn, to, to develop themselves in other aspects of life. So for that reason, I believe that learning should be entertaining and aligned with the way that people think, work, and play.